XY Group invites all AEC industry leaders to the 2024 AEC Small Business and Entrepreneurship Forum, the premier event for small firms in the AEC sector. Experience innovative strategies and insights on May 21st, crafted by Zweig Group's industry experts. Engage in keynotes and interactive sessions focused on recruitment, retention, and business growth. Join Zweig Group for this unique networking opportunity and take your business to new heights. Secure your spot today and be part of the AEC industry's future. Visit ZweigGroup.com for more information. The Zweig Group team looks forward to welcoming you. Welcome to the Zweig Letter Podcast, putting architectural, engineering, planning, and environmental consulting advice and guidance in your ear. Zweig Group's team of experts have spent more than three decades elevating the industry by helping AEP and environmental consulting firms thrive. And these podcasts deliver invaluable management, industry, client, marketing, and HR advice directly to you, free of charge. The Zweig Letter Podcasts, elevating the design industry one episode at a time. Hey folks, and welcome back to another episode of the Zweig Letter Podcast. I'm your host, Randy Wilburn. I'm excited to be with you, as I always am, with another great episode in store Today, I heard from this next guest, I heard from both him and some of his colleagues about a a report that recently came out, and that report covered the design industry and specifically a strategic risk report for 2023, looking at some of the AE business trends. And I'm speaking, of course, with Robert Ewan, who is the co-founder and CEO of Monograph. And Monograph is a firm performance management platform for architecture and engineering practices. And a lot of firms use Monograph to make quick and confident decisions about budgeting and resources to drive their practices forward. I learned about Monograph when I attended an event with Entre Architect. So shout out to Mark LePage and all the wonderful people there. And I got a chance to learn about what Monograph was all about. And I was like, wow, those guys are really interesting. And and I was thankful that they reached out to me. Shout out to Chris Morgan at Monograph and the rest of the team there that suggested that maybe it would be a good idea to have Robert on the podcast to talk about some of the strategic trends that we're seeing in the design industry space. And of course, you know, Zwei Group has been doing this for 32, 33 years now. And it's a, well, actually 35 years. I'm shortchanging Zwei Group, but 35 years. 88 was when Mark started the company. It's now 2023 at the time of recording this. So we've been talking about the challenges facing the design industry for a number of years. And so I was really excited to sit down with Robert and learn a little bit more about what they are finding and what they are seeing, especially since they are right, you know, they're right at the ground floor of of dealing with firms on a day in and day day out basis. And so without further ado, I want to welcome Robert Yuen to the Zweig Letter Podcast. How are you doing, Robert? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Wow. Uh, you've been around for a long time. I'm only 38. Uh, so I feel like this, this podcast, I'm going to have a lot to learn from you. No. Uh, <laughs> Listen, I wasn't throwing out numbers that way because I think here's the thing, and, and, I'll, um, and then I'll let you kind of give everybody your origin story. I think it's important to understand that there is going to be a different perspective about this industry in every generation that encounters it, right? And so I've got you beat by a couple of years, but we won't mention ages. But <laughs> the bottom line is the Zwei Group has been around and it has actually witnessed the iterative effect of the design industry's growth over the decades, over the generations. And so you have, I guess you would be a millennial, I'm a Gen X, and, and then Mark Zweig would be a baby boomer. And each successive generation has had a different experience, right? And now what you're experiencing is even different than Gen Z, which is just new into the workplace, trying to find their way and find their cadence within the design industry space. And so I think it's important for us to be able to to monitor and look at the different generation generational effects that happen in this industry. And 
And I think that the report that you guys are looking at takes that into consideration as I read it and went through it. And we'll make sure that we include this report in our show notes so people can actually see it for themselves. It's a wonderfully done report. And I encourage everyone to take a closer look at it. But today we're going to unpack that report with Robert and learn a little bit more about what they're finding at Monograph and some of the aha moments that came about during this study of of these business trends. So, Robert, I'd love for you just to give your quick superhero origin story, because we always like to know who we're talking to. And everybody has a superhero. I see you have an action figure behind you. That might be you. But... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I really want to highlight. There you go. I love that. So I really want to just let the audience know who you are so you can go back as far as you want or you can, you know, wherever you want to go, that's fine. But I'd love for you just to kind of tell us a little bit about Robert and then and then give us the genesis of of Monograph. Happy to. Like, I would love love your audience to know me a little bit more. And honestly, like, I feel always a little uncomfortable just speaking about myself. But <laughs> I hope I hope to meet every every listener at some point in person. I was born and raised in Chicago. My parents are Chinese immigrants. My dad has a fantastic story. He lived through really, really hard times where he had to smuggle into Hong Kong. It was a 12-hour swim, five friends, only two made it. It was one of those extreme war stories of like how he had to fight for his freedom to get to the United States. Until this day, still alive, he reminds me all my problems are trivial <laughs> compared to his. And this is a classic dad move where like everything I'm facing is just, it's a piece of cake, but it keeps me motivated. But that, that gives, I think, everyone a little bit of insights in terms of like what my childhood was like. We grew up really, really poor. My mom was a stay-at-home mom. I love playing with Legos, which I think every architect can share the same story. And my first exposure to architecture was actually in high school. I was gifted where I tested really well. I went to a high school that had an architectural track, highly competitive, did great. I'm a highly competitive individual. I've tested into my first job. The winner was a summer internship. And that's that's how I got my first exposure professionally. A 16-year-old version of Robert was reorganizing the material libraries at at Robert Architects in Chicago. Parents naturally wanted me to stay close, as close as possible. So I ended up going to school at the University of Illinois, Chicago campus, where I studied architecture. On my very last year, I did an international competition along with universities uh, in Mexico. I placed first and it was designed a Mexico City market. First place prize was a $10,000 traveling scholarship. Wow. Uh, it was incredible. To this day, I still want to go back to being 21. I had about $5,000 saved, so $15,000 total. And I went backpacking for 11 months, 22 countries, two continents. It was a phenomenal experience for a 21-year-old version. I've learned a lot. I saw a lot of architecture. It was incredible. I came back. I took Richard, who was my professor, out to dinner. I immediately started working for Richard for the next two years, right up to the 08, 09 recession. I got really lucky. Obviously, I did not know a recession was going to hit, but I timed it perfectly, got really lucky, and I started grad school. Did my master's at Michigan, two years there. I did a second master's focused on robotics and digital fabrication before returning back to Chicago. Then did about almost a decade of work between really big firms like Skidmore, Owens & Merrill. It's really high-end residential work here in the Bay Area where I reside now. I met two knuckleheads who are now my two co-founders. They did their... And Mark at MIT, classmates, housemates, and now best friends and co-founder of Monograph. They're the reasons and they're part of the reasons why I get up to work every single day. I love that story. And what are their names? Alex and Mo. Okay, perfect. I love that. That was great. I appreciate you sharing that. At what point did you decide? Or, and so first of all, let me ask you this. Are you still a practicing architect? I am not. I think okay. running a, a startup is all consuming. I literally don't have any time to do anything else. My social life went to almost zero. It's pretty bad. (laughs) Well, no, I I can totally appreciate that running a startup myself. It is, it's all you all the time. And it requires a level of commitment that, that may strike some as crazy, but uh, you have to be all in to get something done, to birth something. And you guys have birthed something in Monograph, which I think is really cool. Where? You know, what I'm curious to know before we jump into this report, 
What was your big, when you got involved working with designers and really kind of like after, maybe after grad school in these last, this last decade, if you will, where were your aha moments about the challenges that design firms faced and how they actually ran things? What were your kind of some of the things that really stood out to you that were glaring weaknesses in the design industry space that you felt like, man, I could correct that or I could do it better? Yeah. Well, wow. We can, we can probably have the whole podcast just focus on that. <laughs> there are so many reasons, which is why, it's why we work so hard here at Monograph. Some of the things that like, I saw at big firms was I lied on my hours all the time. <laughs> well, it's all about utilization though, right? I mean, yeah. you know, you, you're held out. They hold out this thing to you and say, hey, you've got to operate at 95, 90% utilization or like, you know, a hundred, right? Which is like yeah. impossible. I would, I would always meet these, these leaders of firms or, you know, like senior project managers that were like, yeah, I'm a hundred percent utilized. And I'm like, there's no way you're a hundred percent utilized, but that's okay. It's fine. It, you know, but <laughs> I, and I think the problem is more systemic than that, right? Like I think on a lot of firms, they don't even tell you what it's for. So as a young designer, you didn't even know about utilization rate. All you're asked for is like, you got to log 40 hours, even if you work 80. Yeah. I was like, well, who, like, is that really useful? If I actually work 80, I'm logging 40. Yeah. Or if I'm working 60, I'm logging 35. Like that, who does this serve? So those are some of the early, let's say, questionable ways of like operating Mm -hmm. earlier days in bigger firms and smaller firms. Yeah. And then what happened was a quarter later, three months later, six months later, like, oh, Robert, you're doing great. You're only working like 40 hours a week. And you're getting all this work done. I was like, oh my God, like I, I've just stabbed myself in the foot here because I wasn't working only 40 hours a week. I was working like 60 hours a week. And now that we have misaligned expectations. What was also obvious too was like, no one told me the budget. I saw that a lot more when I was at smaller firms because then, you know, you have these conversations and sit downs where like, Robert, you're over budget. And I'm like, what well, was the budget? Uh, <laughs> I, can't, I can't hold a budget if, I, if you didn't tell me. And how... How fast are we working against that? Like, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, and the fact that I don't know was a huge problem. In my last position, I got fired. Wow. And like, that was a big hit. It was like, Robert, you just keep missing. We're missing deadlines. We're missing budgets. I was like, you don't tell me a deadline. You don't tell me a budget. Like, this is really hard for me to do my job too. And it, it was one of the biggest aha moments was like, there's a lot of problems here. And I think, I think we can do a lot of work to solve a lot of these problems. Yeah. It was. Was that a shared experience with your partners as well in terms of just what they experienced growing up in the industry? I think it's shared. I think every, every architect I've, I have and many friends of mine have either experienced it firsthand or through osmosis. We've all have, and we've all had happy hours where we're pulling all-nighters, we're behind on a deadline, we're late on a deadline, we're over budget again. I didn't know until, like, until I was told that we're over budget. These are conversations we still have over happy hour. Yeah. I mean, it's, it seems like it's a never ending saga, right? And I'm sure when you were at that Entree Architect event, you heard a lot of stories that kind of fell in line with what your experiences have been in the past and what they still are to this day as you consult firms and help them help themselves, if you will. Yeah. We are making a massive difference, but it's a big industry. So there's still a lot of work left. I think, you know, I, I found my purpose. So I'll be doing this for a very, very long time. And my hope is like every day we bring a massive impact to the industry, we bring visibility, we bring transparency, and we reduce risk. Well, I mean, the industry needs people like you and, you know, Jamie Claire Kaiser and, you know, and so many others at Zweig and, and at so many other firms that understand the, the mission of this industry and, and want to help firm owners and firm leaders get out of their own way and operate at their highest level possible. And it does require a certain dose of medicine. We all have to take our own medicine and understand where our shortcomings are and how we can overcome them. And I think it's, I think, you know, reports like the one that you guys did, this strategic risk report of 2023, top risks, metrics, and strategies to overcome economic uncertainty are very important, right? Because I, th I think a lot of times what you guys have unearthed in this report, a lot of times firms won't even adhere to or even acknowledge until it's too late. And that's, that's the sad part, right? It's like, you know, you know, you know when your, your tire's running low with air, you've got to put some air in it. If you want to continue to ignore it, eventually you're going to be on the rim. 
And then once you're on the rim, we all know that you're going to ruin. Not only do you ruin, is a tire ruined, but you may lose the rim and the rim could theoretically cause you to get into a major accident. I love, I love car analogies. So like the lack of air in tires is a great one. I actually sometimes use gas, right? Like if you don't have any more gas, you're not going anywhere. Right. And the first thing you got to do to know if you have gas or not is you need the gas meter. Like yep. you, just, you just need something to just tell you. So like you got to track your gas and you got to see how much gas you have left. Those are the first principles you should do as an analogy to business all the time. A lot of small firms don't track. I was like, well, then how do you know? And then once you do track, you got to look at it. Uh, <laughs> you got to build some systems around tracking the performance of your business, the health metrics of your business. And then you got to get good over time of understanding what does that mean? I think, you know, I've always learned there's always an expression or phrase that I've used. You only get what you inspect. If you don't inspect it, you'll never get it. Right. And I think what I have experience working with a lot of phenomenal architects and engineers for that matter, is that when you're super talented in your space, in your niche, in your area or specialty, a lot of times, you know, you are an artisan, you are an artist. And sometimes you treat the business in that vein and you lose sight of some of the tactical things that need to be done behind the scenes in order for you to perpetuate and continue to do that art and that artisan or that craftsmanship that you're so good or adept at creating. And I think firms need to remember that. We always need to be, you know, minding the back office as much as we mind our interactions with our clients. And it's incredibly important, but too often we tend to focus on one and not the other. Yeah, I think hyper-focus on just one and not the other is so common. All my friends kind of experience the same thing. I think it's really important for everyone who's listening to, to have self-awareness and acknowledge where you're really, really good and really, really strong yeah. and where you're not. Yeah. And where you're not, what are you going to do about it? I think trying to solve every problem yourself, which is a classic architect problem, we feel like we can solve every problem ourselves, is not a very like, wise move. There's a lot of people that are fantastically strong running a practice from a business perspective. Yeah who are great at collecting the invoices that you've sent out, that are great at understanding how much cash and runway you have. Let them be strong where they are strong and allow yourself to be strong where you are strong. It's really, really important. You know, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because when I look at, like I've had, again, like I said, I've kind of grown up in this industry. I was in my 20s when I first got involved and now I'm in my 50s. And I've seen a lot of the change that I, we talked about earlier with the different generational changes. But I look at the firms that are super, super successful, and all of those firm leaders have been able to apply the common sense approach that you just mentioned to the way that they do their work, right? Where they don't have to have their hands in every little thing. They lead by example, they set up boundaries, and they enable people to develop into their own space and be the best version of themselves within an organization which is sometimes very difficult to do, whether you're an engineer or an architect or, or any other vertical or profession. I get it. And because we all want to be seen as the valuable reason why things get done in an organization, but there is a certain amount of humility that comes along with great leaders that when it's practiced properly will really create opportunities for growth within an organization where everybody gets to step up to the plate and get, a, get an at-bat. And, I'm, I I'm love, using, and now I'm using a baseball analogy. <laughs> so. I love this topic because like, if we're looking back at like the four themes of the report, this is the very last one. This right. is all about talent. Yeah. And yeah. it's all yeah. about like, how do you encourage your environment where talent is a good thing that you want to support the growth of talent? Yep. And to do that, sometimes you have to be coach and not player. <laughs> and you have to let the player play. Yeah. Yeah. And guess what? Like Michael Jordan is great. As a player, he's not great as a, a firm owner. And I don't know if he'll be great as a, as a coach. And that's okay. Yeah. I think you have to identify the roles you play when you're a firm owner. At some point, the firm's going to mature and you yeah. have to be coach. Yeah, absolutely. I love that aspect. And I will just add one more thing that I learned about that whole, that whole situation. Since you brought up Michael Jordan, in the eyes of being a coach, yeah. Dean Smith 
you know, when they went into the, they called a timeout and there was about 18 seconds left in the game with North Carolina and Georgetown. And I think North Carolina was down by one when Jordan made his shot. But at, at the, you know, at the end of the day, what people forget is that James Worthy, who was an All-American, was on the team with Michael Jordan. And the coach decided to give the ball to the young kid, right? And that's essentially what changed Michael Jordan's trajectory. It changed everything for him, that he was entrusted to take that winning shot. And in that same way, just like what you're describing, companies, firm leaders need to be willing to allow some of these young people that are under them that have the promise and the capabilities, they need to be given the ball to take that shot. And you'd be surprised how, you know, things can can radically change in an organization when you give people those opportunities to really shine. Of course, you're always going to have those individuals, right? And James Worthy was none the worse for it. I mean, he went on to have a Hall of Fame career. Let's be clear about this. (laughs) But you have to make space for everybody on the team to step up into their own capabilities. And certainly Michael Jordan did that. But I just thought it was interesting because I learned some of the specifics behind that whole conversation. But most people were aghast that that Dean Smith would allow a freshman to take that ball, but he did it and won the championship for North Carolina. So he he saw something in Michael. Yeah, absolutely. He saw something and like, we got to let, and he, Dean's the coach. He's like, you gotta, you gotta invest in your, in your top players. Yeah. Young or not young, like you invest in your team always. Absolutely. I think that is something that's super heightened in 2023, where I think a lot of firm did a lot of hiring over the last two years. And we might be facing the next like year and a half where we might do as an industry a little less hiring. So now it's really focused on retention and talent development and, and grow your team. You're going to be successful, not just because of you, but because of the people that are playing on your team. Yep. Yeah. Invest in them. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, since we already, we, we talked a little bit about the last topic of, of the report. Let's do, let's get into the actual report so that everybody knows what we're talking about. The Monograph 2023 Strategic Risk Report is a 32-page study that uncovers the most urgent issues facing architecture and engineering firms as their clients react to economic uncertainty. The result is a collection of strategies that enable firms to tackle risk associated with money, clients, time, and talent, which we just talked about. And so AE leaders reading this report will probably walk away feeling confident about the steps that they can take to withstand uncertainty and drive their firms forward. So for those that haven't had the ability to read this report yet, why don't we just kind of start off right at the top and and talk about, you know, just the one of the first things that that firms have to consider, which would be economic uncertainty, which impact a number of factors of a growing design firm. It's a really good word. And I think you summed it up. There's four themes in the report. Economic uncertainties is really what, if you turn on the news, you see it everywhere. You see the war in Ukraine. You see our gas prices going up. You see our, the cost of eggs. Oh my God, I was at Whole Foods yesterday. It's incredible, <laughs> it uh, incredible. How, much, how much eggs are, are, are now. So like things are changing really fast around us. And you might also notice that like the phone's not ringing as, as much as it was a summer ago. You might also realize that some projects might be going on pause. We're dealing with a very different world today. I think first acknowledging that and then really taking a step back and being thoughtful in terms of like, how are we going to navigate now? Now that we first accept that a lot of things are changing, they're changing really fast. Every architect, every firm owner, every practitioner should be stepping back a bit and really looking back and seeing what do we got to do now? How do we move forward? Navigating uncertain Economic uncertainty is a really big topic for the next two years. I think everyone needs to bring it up front and find their path in terms of like how to get get through it. Yeah. And so what do you, because the issue that you talked about was how economic uncertainty actually has an effect of straining client relationships. Hmm. How do you resolve or encourage firms to avoid that straining of client relationships? There's a couple of things you can do like immediately if you're not, if you're not already doing it. They are your clients. Get to know them. Yeah. Get, like it's really simple. Get to know them. Get to know what's going on. Obviously, architecture is a privileged industry. It takes quite a lot of capital to build architecture. Yeah. It's our job as architects to have and build those long term relationships with our clients and double down now. Reestablish if those relationships weren't really tight. 
and ask really critical questions in terms of their exposure. We've all saw the news with First Republic and Silicon Valley Bank. Yeah, like, yeah. you know, a question, I live in here in the Bay Area, a question if I was an architect was like, do you keep your money there? Yeah. Do you have a lot of cash exposed to the public markets? Because generally speaking, the entire public market's down like 80%. Yeah. It's just good information. I, I just want to know. And it's continue to build on that relationship with clients, which will give you a lot more peace of mind in terms of like the stability of this client and how you can assist. As architects, we want to be in service and we want to, be, we want to get ahead of problems and not be super reactive when problems arise and we didn't know. Yeah. So I think managing client relations is super important. Reestablishing client relations so you know where their financial positions are. And then next is like really understanding who's your repeat clients and how do you continue to now double down on business development, knowing that the phones are going to ring a little less. Um, you have to lean on your strongest clients and you have to reestablish foundational business development practices you yeah. have to change work. Yeah, no, I mean, those are all great things. And that's it's something that I'm always telling anyone that will listen to me is like, you know, sometimes you just need to reach out to your client just because, not because you want new work or not because you want to know what's what's coming down the pike for them, but you just want to see how they're doing, right? I always tell people, I say, I always poll individuals that have client responsibilities. I gauge how successful they are by how well mm -hmm. they know their clients. You know, what do they like to do when they're not at work? What do they, you know, there are some downtimes that we experience in our industry where it's a perfect opportunity for you to really get to know your clients a little bit better and to engage with them on just a peer level and a human level, as opposed to, you know, what can you do for me right now? And there is just a different approach. And I think what happens is typically when you, you know, friends can weather storms together with friends, right? And it's the same principle when you work with clients. If it's just about the next project or the next opportunity, clients can can smell that a mile away. And so you really want to to set yourself up for success by by actually showing a client that you really care. A lot of what Robert just mentioned, those are some of the simple things that we uh, can do in the design industry space to shore ourselves up and to continue keeping that conversation going in a positive direction with any and all clients, even ones that you aren't actively working with right now, because a client from yesterday can be a client for tomorrow. I think, I don't believe it's in our report, but statistically proven that in the industry, a bulk of the work is repeat work. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. It's repeat Absolutely. clients. And I think every one of my friends know that too. Who are, and like, what's excellent, like what's really weird is like, you know, your work is repeat work. Yeah. You have to invest in those relationships. Yeah. No differently than you invest in your personal relationships or with your best friends. These are all relationships. Treat them like relationships. If you treat them so transactionally, and then we're going to have happy hour, and then you complain about why the work is so transactional. Yeah. I was like, hey, it's a two way street. Right. <laughs> like, if you don't want transactional work, you have to build the relationship. And when you build the relationship, you won't get transactional work. Be very mindful in terms of like what you want and invest. Yeah. No, I mean, that's well put. You move on in this report to kind of talk about how inflation is outpacing billing and cash flow. For the cash flow strapped firm right now, what are some of the recommendations that have come out of this particular report? If you're already cash flow strapped, I think you have to be very reactive. Some of those tactics are not immediately in the strategic report. I think acknowledging that you're strapped and understanding what your runway is, what is in the report is you need visibility into your cash. Yeah. So these are really great times to invest in systems so you know what your cash position is and you know how long that cash will last. That's a really important thing to understand for every firm owner. It's not just how much cash you have, it's how much cash you, that you can sustain as a business. What is your runway? That's a term we use here in startup land, but really applicable for small businesses. If you stop collecting altogether, how long can you sustain? This is also why cash flow is really important. Think of a landlord collecting rent. Cash flow is every month. Yep. It's great. It's predictable. It's not ups and downs. It's not apps and flows. It is predictable. If your cash flow is strained already, my first recommendation is like re-audit how you invoice. Are you phase-based or are you monthly? 
I have, I'm going to assume that you might be phase based. It's time to reevaluate if you can go to monthly because you want predictable cash flow. Yeah. You don't want to go two, three months without sending an invoice and then another two, three months of like before you wait to collect. Now you're looking at like half a year before money hits the bank. So just be really thoughtful there that you want a business where you can be extraordinarily creative on one spectrum and on the other spectrum, very boring, very predictable. Right. That's a good business. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, typically you don't think of like uh, boring and, and design firms in the same same sentence. But yeah, there are some benefits to that, certainly. And I would encourage firms to really think about that. But you bring up some really good points. And, and one of the things that I see from a cash flow perspective that I think it's, it's one of the biggest things that has always driven people like Mark Zweig and, and Chad Kleinen's crazy has been simply the inability of firms to stay on top of their billings. And that's like one of the big, it's a, it's a simple fix. It's an accounting correction, right? And um, it's a lot of times it's, why would you wait until 45 days or 60 days before you send out an invoice when that work has been done or you know anything along those lines, just send the invoice out. So it, it can't hurt. I think this is also why the report structure this way, where like we really want to focus on client and economic uncertainty first. Yeah. Because it paves the way for you to have difficult conversations around billings and cash flow. Yep. Right. If we already have a relationship together, like I'm less scared to send that invoice now versus wait a couple months. Because we have a relationship and you know it's coming. It's not a surprise. And it's it's what the business needs. Yep. I think navigating cash flow, I think CVG CEO Todd said it best. Like this is where utilization rate and realization rates becomes really, really handy. But you first have to track it. You first have to track your business. And then these these measures become really key metrics in terms of understanding like, is your business efficient? Yeah. Is your business upside down? These are really important questions to always be aware of and acknowledge. For good or for bad. Yeah. I mean, there's, uh, gosh, there's so much, you know, when you think of it. And, and when I first read the report and looked at it, I was like, man, you know, I don't know that this is, is there anything, is there any sunny disposition that comes from this report? Right. Because it's, it's almost like, man, you know, dump, 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 dump. This is what's going on. This is the state of the design industry, but there is a silver lining in every aspect of this report. Right. And, and there are just some things that you need to think of. And, Sometimes firms just have to be reminded that they can do the busy work of having a design firm better. There's always room for improvement. There's always places where you can make corrections and modifications to how you run your business to be more efficient, to be more on top of, of your budgets, to be more on top of the cash flow. There are always places to improve. And I think if nothing else, this report is a simple reminder of that. You know, and it's not so much an, an admonishment of the industry as it is an encouraging place to look and say, yeah, well, you know, we're, we're going to have challenges. And there have always been challenges that this industry has been faced with, but it's how we interact and deal with those challenges that ultimately determine how successful we, and I say we as, as design firm, design firm leaders, how we will operate moving forward. And so. You know, I just think it's important to have these reminders. And that's why I see so much value in a report like what you put together. I feel like I heard a Rocky reference in the middle of that. <laughs> <laughs> I 100% agree. And the way I look at it and the way I, I view Monograph and the state of the, the industry is kind of like a design crit and a project that's never ending, yeah. which is actually a really exciting project. Like back in school, like you... Like your firm is your practice, yeah. is your design project. There's always room for improvement, always. It's never perfect. And having a design crit of like pointing out where, where some of those opportunities are to improve is critical. Mm -hmm. It's actually only one of the few projects in life that there is no like immediate end. It's actually really different than like a, a standard professional architectural project where like the end is when they cut the tape and like the building is done. Yeah. But there's some excitement and nostalgic moment when you go back to like studio life and projects are very iterative. And then you have that one stubborn professor that walks around your desk and flips your model upside down at two in the morning and keeps walking 
I was like, oh my God, I didn't, I didn't see that. These are really, really exciting moments. And I think the risk report is really here to acknowledge where some of these opportunities are and how we can go about it. They're not yeah. that hard. We no. Can all do it. no. And here's the other thing too. There are a lot of design firms that make money in a down market. Down markets so, are huge opportunities. It exactly. is opportunities. Exactly. Yeah. That's, it, it actually may be where you find your blue ocean, if you will, um, if I can use that analogy as well. So, so you also talk about um, budget constraints, which add pressure to do more with less. So talk a little, just a little bit about how design firms can, can navigate the challenges of budget constraints and doing more with less. Well, I think first this, this goes into like put it in processes and systems. Yeah. Like you have to acknowledge, well, in a down market where times are uncertain, you can't solve all problems with a hire. Like that's just the reality. I cannot solve this problem with just a new hire. How else can I solve this problem? Well, you can be more efficient. You can put in really good systems now. You can get better at communications. You can get better at check-ins. And you can put in the right systems to measure how projects are going. This way, effectively managing your budget and getting more efficient at pulling off the work. But it all starts with like acknowledging that there are budget constraints and then starting to invest in the technology and in infrastructure and processes now. They'll pay dividends for many years to come. Yeah. Was there anything else that stood out about for you guys about that section of the report? that maybe was an aha moment for you? So we, we do this intentionally. In the report, there's an acknowledgement where some of the areas where you can get a lot more back is to start to delegate some of the repeatable tasks that a firm owner has to do. For too long, I think firm owners have held on too much back office responsibilities. Yeah. And delegating that workload across the board can absolutely get your time back, ensure that the business is more efficient, but the big takeaway here is for a firm owner to get time back. Because like when you get time back as a firm owner in a down market, this is where you're going to spend it on your clients. Yeah, absolutely. You're going to spend it on, on your current clients and you're going to spend it on looking for new work, Yeah, which is going to propel your business forward. But you first have to shed some of the tasks that you've held too close and you don't have to. Examples are back office administrative work. Examples here at Monograph that we see a lot that have helped a lot of our customers scale is the invoicing workflow. You know who knows the project really, really well? They're project managers. Right. <laughs> like they know exactly what's working, what's not working, and exactly where the, where the project's at, even yeah. better than you. Delegate some of that responsibility to the team. That will unlock a lot of time and will unlock the next level of ownership and leadership. Yeah. You know, I'm always saying, and I've said it in, in several leadership training sessions and some of the principals academies that I've done for Zweig is that as a leader, your job is to work yourself out of a job. You know? <laughs> and they always say that, right? And it's not that anybody's going to get fired. It's just that you're going to create other opportunities for people to step into some of the roles that you've been carrying so that you can then move on to something even bigger and better, right? Or as we like to say, when we talk about the visioning aspect of being a leader, right? If you're a leader and you're constantly at a 5,000 foot level view, you are not focusing on the growth and the long-term prospects for the organization that you're a part of. You've got to get up above the clouds. You've got to be up at 25,000, 30, 35,000 feet. And in order to do that, you have to entrust people below you to step into some of the things that you're doing so that you can then go on and do bigger and better things. And then that's not to demean the things that you used to do by saying, oh, you're no, that, you know, that, that, that stuff is no longer worthy of your attention. It's just that a growing firm is constantly growing leaders and you can't grow leaders if you're not creating opportunities for those leaders to step into their, their future, if you will. I think that's a really good way to think about it. And I think it's not, it's never about demeaning the work. If anything, it would create more empathy for the work. Yeah. Right. You create empathy because you've been there and you've done it <laughs> and you can relate, which right. is really important. Like I, like if you can relate to your designers, to your project managers, to your project architects, as they continue to grow into managers and leaders, 
Yeah. That's really, really powerful because you have a lot of empathy to lean on and you have a lot of experience to lean on. But you have to constantly be pushing yourself. It's a core requirement of being a firm owner to so always be growing. Yeah. And always be shedding some of the work so you can tackle the next challenge. Yeah. You're not shedding work for the sake of shedding work. None of us are going to shed work so we can sit on a yacht. No, and, no, no, and, no, no. And drink martinis. We're doing it so we can tackle the next biggest thing. Yeah. I mean, you might actually, when you shed some things, you might actually end up doing more stuff, but that's okay because you're doing it at a different level. And the results that you achieve at that level may have a tremendous exponential effect on the bottom line of the organization. You can imagine if, you're, if your organization is small, you're very hands-on, you're on every project. When the organizing grows a little bit, you're in charge of delegating to managers to yeah. manage the work. Now your job is to be a little bit hands-on and a lot of coaching. At a certain point, if we're going back to sports analogy, you're the franchise owner. Your only job then is to hire and maintain the big projects that are coming in and out. You have managers of managers that are doing their jobs and that are continuing to grow under your watch. But now you're, from a sports analogy, you own the team. Your only job now is to hire great people. Unless you're Jerry Jones. But that's, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. I apologize. No shade against any of my Dallas fans uh, out there because I'm a Pittsburgh Steeler guy. But but no, as you were saying that, all I could think about as I was playing back in my head, those firm owners that have allowed their organizations to thrive and grow under leadership below them, right? And not have their hand on every little thing. And I think there's never been a better example of how that can have a benefit, but it can also have a negative effect. You know, and you can take like the, one of the largest architecture and engineering companies in the world, Gensler. And he built that business in one lifetime. Yeah. It's insane. Yeah. yeah. And he's incredible. Look mm -hmm. at all the people that he, that firm employs now and the work they do and the size that they've grown it in one lifetime. is in, It's astonishing. Yeah. I think constantly going after the next challenge, allowing your talent and your team to operate and they're operating under really good infrastructure, processes, yeah. and systems that will support them. These are the areas that everyone needs to be auditing and re-evaluating re over, over the next year and yeah. constantly, actually, to make sure it's still, still scalable. Yeah, absolutely. Man, we could go on and on about this, but I think, I think people understand that. And, and this is certainly one of those hard what I call a come to Jesus moments where, where leaders have to recognize some of their shortcomings in this area and not feel like they've got to have their hand in everything. Because that, I mean, when you look at like, I mean, Gensler is a perfect example of that. Art Gensler was, is a genius. And the bottom line is that what they've been able to accomplish is somewhat replicatable, but maybe on a smaller scale within your organization. You, you just have to be willing to be comfortable with giving up some things in the process as a leader. And that, I don't like the word giving up. Let's use the word empower. Okay, there you go. Right? It's much more positive. Like, I don't, I'm not going to give up something. I'm going to empower someone else. Yeah. To do it. You're right. That's actually a much better word. That's, and, I, that was a, a poor choice of words on my part, but you're right. Empowerment is everything. It's everything. Yeah. And I think what, what every firm owner is good at and it's because they're firm owners, because they're extreme generalists. That's how they were able to start their business. Yeah. Over time, you have to acknowledge in some areas of the business, you need hyper specialization. Yep. You need it. Yeah. And that's what's going to help the business. Like, I'm an architect. At a certain point, I can't do the books. Like, it might work at a certain scale, but over time, like, yeah. you need, like, this is why bookkeeper and accountant, hyper specialized professionals, you need to give them the space to do their job. Yeah. If you start a business at some point, you have to acknowledge there are better project managers out there than I am. Yeah. There have to be. Because like when I was a project manager, I was also running the practice, hiring, running payroll, chasing clients. As a firm owner, you're always stretched thin. You're a hyper generalist. Yeah, absolutely. You know, as I think about this, and I know that as we, when we started this conversation, we brought up talent and talent is kind of like the final 
factor in your report that you talk about, and you talk about talent shortages and how it limits opportunities for firm owners. What would you add to what we've already shared about the talent aspect and your findings in this 2023 report? I would say it's really important to be transparent. So I go back to the last vocabulary of empowerment. With talent, outside of everything else we've already said, I think it's important to give them the transparency and visibility into the business. It's really, really important. I think it, everyone will find that it will expedite growth. Yeah. When you say transparent, are you thinking maybe like open book management, just a you know, ways that you can let everybody in on how the firm is operating at all levels? So I think everything is like a spectrum and they're not like a switch where like you got to go 100% open book or not. Yeah. I think yeah. there's always improvements to allowing a little bit more information than you're comfortable with. And mm-hmm. every firm owner has to make their own decision of what they're comfortable with. Sure. But I think based on the history of the entire practice, more is good. More yeah. is what this generation of architects need. The practice of architecture is more complicated than ever. Yeah. There's more consultants. I'm not that old and there's already a lot more consultants than when I was practicing. Oh, absolutely. So like the, absolutely. The, the complexity of pulling a project off is actually really hard now. Yeah. There's a lot of moving parts and young designers, young architects, young managers need more visibility. If we go back to the car analogy, they just need to see. They're driving. Allow them to see enough of the road. Yeah, absolutely. And I love that you have a piece in here where you talk about leadership actions to reduce staff risk. And I'm not going to repeat all of them. There's some really good ideas in here from some uh, really amazing people, including Kimberly Dowdell, who I know. And uh, just you should repeat I mean, it. Yeah, I'm just not, I'm I mean, not looking at the report. <laughs> yeah, just I mean, well, her idea simply is to nurture young graduates with one to five years of experience by being more intentional about mentorship and cultivating a diverse talent pool. I've been talking about mentoring for a long time. And sometimes that's a curse word in some firms, right? Because it's like, we don't have the time for that. We've got work to do. We've got billable hours. But what I, I see firms that are hyper successful, they have mentorship programs in place. And I've actually done talks about that because it is one of those lost arts. I mean, one of the challenges that this industry faces when you talk about talent shortages and when you talk about raising up another generation is that knowledge gap that's retiring, that's graying out in this industry. There are people that know so much in our space, but they're retiring on a daily basis. And then some of them are dying. And it's like, how do we, how do we stop that loss of knowledge? Right. You know, so that they don't exit out. And I think that there, I mean, there are, I think there are a number of really, really positive ways to bridge that knowledge divide that you have between Gen Z and several of those boomers. I mean, I, I've always told the story about like there's a there's an architectural firm out of LA area and you know I'm not going to mention their name but the founder had basically sold most of his interest to some of the younger colleagues of his that were now running the firm yet and still this guy was like 78 years old he is now probably 81 82 still practicing mind you the total prototypical bespectacled black turtleneck horn rim glass architect right But honestly, this dude brought in more business than anybody else. And it's like, well, he knew it. and He didn't need to work. I mean, he had other forms of income coming in. He didn't need to work. He just loved what he was doing. And it's like that generation of talent in this space, a lot of those folks that haven't transferred that knowledge, when they leave, that knowledge is gone. It's so important to acknowledge that you have to spend time here and invest here. This podcast, there's so many analogies. I'm going to drop another one. Like, <laughs> I, I have faith that everyone brushes their teeth every day. Yes. Yes. Maybe you do not skip. It. Yeah. You do not skip it. Right. You do not skip it. No different than investing in your team and transferring that knowledge. Yeah. Like, yeah. there's no excuse. Oh, I don't have time. You got to make time. You don't say that to your toothbrush. I don't have time. Yeah. You make time because it's critical. It's part of if you're brushing your teeth, it's part of your dental health. Yep. And you know that. And if you're investing in your young people and transferring that knowledge, you're investing in your business. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, you couldn't have said it any better. And I think the challenge is that there's so much here to unpack. 
And I, I think that I don't want anybody that gets this report to be overwhelmed. I, I just think that you need to dive in and maybe sit around the table, grab lunch from Panera and go through this report and highlight some of the areas that you're weak, right? Just be transparent and honest about it. Hey, we, we suck in this area. This is something we can improve upon. Here are some best practices that they're seeing that are working. And I think that's one of the ways that you can really unpack this report. And then also, if there are parts of this report that you guys have already acknowledged and that you're finding success in, then that, that's an area where you need to say, hey, we're doing good in this area. You know, we're having some success here because I think it's important. I mean, it's, it's why firms like Monograph and why firms like Zwei Group exist, because these firms exist to make clients more successful. Full stop. And, you know, whether it's through reports like this 2023 report or just general consulting, the goal is to help you kind of get out of your own way, take some really good advice and take some of the wins that some of your peer firms are experiencing so that you can utilize them yourself and benefit from some of those same situations. So, I mean, there, there's so much here and we, we could go on and on, uh, Robert, talking about this. So. Well, I just, I mean, listen, I, I'd love, I'll, I'll give you a second just to close out, but is there anything else that you would like to, besides obviously it tell, encouraging everybody to get a copy of this report, and we'll put a link to share this report out in the show notes, but is there anything that you would like to just add as we close out this episode? One, I, I want to say thank you. Given me the stage, this conversation has been amazing. And we've been extraordinarily open around the topics that are like super top of mind. So yeah. first thing I want to say is thank you. The Absolutely. second thing I want to say outside of everything else was just so everyone knows, we have a team here behind Monograph that's extraordinarily passionate, and motivated, and our only mission is to be in service to the practice. Yeah. yeah. That's all we're working on. We're building tools for the practice to help navigate the next 12 months, the next one, four months. And ideally for the life of a practice, we're super passionate. I'm super passionate and I'm just really thankful for, for having the stage and a fantastic Tuesday morning. Absolutely. Well, you know, I, as, as uh, Chad Kleinens always says, a rising tide lifts all ships, right? And, and as Y group is rising, as monograph is rising and as they continue to go out into the design industry space to encourage firms to be the best version of themselves. We all get better because of that. So thank you so much for the work that you're doing there at Monograph. And I've got to figure out a way for Monograph and Zweig to team up on something really cool because I think the industry needs it, right? I mean, we, we just can't cover every base, uh, but I think together we're, we're always stronger. And so I appreciate all the work that you're doing to meet the needs of design professionals around the country, around the world for that matter. Anyone that will read your words and, and adhere to them will be the beneficiary of, of that great, great advice and guidance. So thank you for all that you're doing, Robert, and, and your team there at Monograph. If anybody wants to connect with you, what's the easiest way for them to do that? Oh, super easy. Just email me, Robert okay. at Monograph. Okay. <laughs> we'll put that on the show notes. You guys got that. That's, that's a real simple one. And it's, it's, uh, it's Monograph. The website is? Monograph.com. Right. Monograph.com. So. Just like an architect's monograph. There you go. I love that. Well, thank you so much, Robert. We really appreciate it. I got to give your, uh, your dog speaking credit for this episode as well. So I appreciate him or her sharing. And uh, we certainly appreciate you taking time. I oh, <laughs> really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to connect with us. This has been a really rich conversation and I can't wait to share it with our audience. And if you've listened to this and it's been impactful for you, please reach out to Robert please reach out to myself and, and the rest of the folks here at Zwei Group or the folks at Monograph to say thank you and to let us know how we can help you as you continue to grow your design organization. So we appreciate you, Robert. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. Absolutely. Good one. Absolutely. Well, folks, that's another episode of the Zweig Letter Podcast. To learn more about one of the oldest newsletters in the design industry, visit zweiggroup.com. You can read articles online, listen to this podcast, and sign up for a free subscription to the newsletter and have it delivered right into your email inbox every Monday morning. Sign up today. For more info about Zwei Group's advisory services or any Zwei Group publications, visit zweiggroup.com. You can subscribe to the Zweig Letter podcast wherever you listen to it. And please 
consider rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. I'm your host, Randy Wilburn, and we'll see you back here soon with another new episode of the Zweig Letter Podcast. Peace. Thanks for tuning in to the Zweig Letter Podcast. We hope that you can be part of elevating the industry and that you can apply our advice and information to your daily professional life. For a free digital subscription to the Zweig Letter, please visit thezweigletter.com slash subscribe to gain more wisdom and inspiration in addition to information about leadership, finance, HR, and marketing your firm. Subscribe today.